All right, so my uh, first slide here, uh, as folks are probably well aware, over 85% of all Americans right now are under some sort of stay at home order. There's really only five states in the entire US that do not have some kind of municipal or statewide stay at home order going on, and we actually happen to be one of them. The others are South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and Arkansas, and that's at this moment, and that can change at any moment. Florida uh, went that direction, and the colors in peach here do not have a statewide stay-at-home order, but all their major municipalities, for instance, in Texas, Dallas, Houston, Austin, et cetera, they all have some kind of stay-at-home order, so the vast majority of the population in those states are under a stay-at-home order, and that is having a dramatic effect on the economy as we know. So you look at what I got going on here with my next slide, and uh, what you'll see, next slide, is uh, that unemployment has actually been, I think we're not, we're not moving on. There we go. Okay. Uh, you've probably seen the headlines, but um, last week we had 3.28, as you'll recall, 3.28 million people for the week ending March 21st file for unemployment. That was a almost four times the highest amount ever in 1982. We're about 900,000 people. If I uh, adjusted for population growth, because it was, it was actually 695, but if you compare it to today's population, that would have had to be about 900,000. And last week was a new record many times over at uh, 3.28 million. So then yesterday's report comes out and there were on the high end, people saying maybe 4 million, maybe 5 million. The industry consensus was about three and a half. And lo and behold, we had 6.64 million new people apply for unemployment. So in the last two weeks, that's been 10 million people who've applied. And you may or may not have heard that a lot of states, their websites are crashing. They're having problems getting through uh, days and days and days to finally reach somebody on the phone. These state unemployment offices are just absolutely overwhelmed. So there's a backlog of filers right now, and we just don't know how many. So the outlook going forward is, uh, is, is pretty grim as far as that goes. Now, the month unemployment report came out today, but it ended about the first two weeks of March. So when all heck broke loose, uh, after that report, the data for that report actually came out and pretty much everyone has dismissed it as, as not very useful because of the things that have transpired afterwards. So my next slide, I want to talk about key Federal Reserve actions, okay? And they've taken a lot of different actions and we don't have time today to discuss them all, but the big ones are, and the ones that are going to impact us, the consumer, and us in ag the most, first of all, the rate cut. So the feds have cut rates for overnight borrowing to nearly 0%, between zero and a quarter of a percent. So what that boils down to is banks can borrow money from the Federal Reserve at almost no interest. That really, that really basically uh, uh, enhances what's called the required reserve ratio. They can have more money on hand to loan out because uh, they can borrow it and have, have that in reserves. Then this quantitative easing, QE, we remember that from 2008. And essentially that's large scale purchase of various bonds such as treasuries and mortgage backed securities. And this coming in here is important because what we saw happen, yes, the Fed cuts rates, but that doesn't necessarily mean that consumer lending would, uh, is, is consumer lending rates are gonna decline, okay? Because we've heard about the crowding out effect. Some people may remember that from uh, school or whatever, or just in hearing it. And what can happen is if the U.S. Treasury is issuing a whole bunch of Treasury securities and bonds or whatever the case may be, interest rates or yields have to go up for corporate uh, uh, borrowing. Well, if the Fed comes in and buys these Treasuries and buys these mortgage-backed securities up, then there's fewer of them on the market demand may be strong for them and the yield winds up going down. Now the discount window, this is where banks borrow money. It's usually one day or just really overnight. Now they can borrow for 90 days. So the banks can have this increase in cash that they can loan out and don't have to worry about paying it back in the morning. And then of course, uh, term asset backed securities loan facility. This is uh, the Fed's buying auto loans and credit card loans and student loans and SBA loans, all to keep all to encourage banks to lend as the cash will be available and to keep rates on those lower. All right. And then finally, this corporate paper and corporate credit actions. Uh, this is so that very large companies can borrow money at a lower rate 
than what they would have had to borrow uh, otherwise with, uh, again, going back to that crowding out. So on my next slide, I kind of show how that's having an impact. And you'll recall from one of uh, my earlier talks that yes, interest rates, the, the spread between the 10 year T-bill, T-note, okay, and corporate bonds, BAA investment grade bonds had gone way up. So now this last week, the Fed coming in and buying corporate uh, uh, investment grade corporate bonds, that rate has started to come down some. So it spiked up really quick uh, with the influx of debt that's about to hit the market. The Fed comes in and starts buying up that debt and it starts reducing that spread between the 10 year T note and uh, corporate bonds. All right, so my next slide, uh, this is what it's the effect that it was having on commercial like mortgage rates. So the five one arm, the 30 year fixed rate mortgage and the 15 year fixed, again, we saw a spike, okay? Uh, mortgage backed securities uh, causing a spike in the uh, interest rate on mortgages. The Fed comes in and starts buying these mortgage backed securities and starts taking action. And in the last week or so, we've started to see these rates come down again. So that's kind of, that's what, I'm, what I was trying to say. Those are some of the key actions taking that's going to affect the main street consumer and ag just like us is, the unintended consequence of the government issuing all this debt and issuing all these treasuries, because as you know, uh, Ron's gonna talk about it here in a minute, that $2.2 .2 trillion, I, I won't call it a stimulus, but recovery package. Well, somebody has to buy that debt. And if it's all the private sector, then that drives rates up. But the Fed's coming in and buying them, so try as a, as a, as a mechanism to, uh, to keep those rates lower. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about real quick is income and substitution. And this is kind of leading into what Dr. Olson and Tim Petrie are gonna talk about. And that shift in food consumption, okay? I just said that 10 more million people wound up unemployed in the last two weeks, and it's probably gonna get worse before it gets better. Uh, that's to add to the 5.8 million already unemployed. And we, can, we call something like that an income shock, okay? So is high unemployment for some, low consumer confidence for others, so people who may have lost their job, or not lost their job, I should say, uh, they still have some income, but maybe they're pretty worried and they're not really encouraged. They're going to spend as little as possible uh, in the event that something winds up happening. So they substitute their choices in the short run and maybe even the intermediate run for uh, lower, uh, lower uh, cost calories. Okay. So when we think about uh, people on their food budget, you know, it's a calorie gain and how many calories, how much nutrients can I get for my buck? And my next slide is a nice little table uh, kind of showing this. And if you look at the top, flour, okay, the dollars per calorie of flour, you get for one dollar of flour, you get 4,464 calories. So that is, a, that is two days worth of calories for a dollar out of flour. You can go down the list here, ramen noodles, plain oats, all these different uh, food groups. And what you notice is a lot of them are what? They're coming from small grains like wheat and oats and barley and these kind of things. You get a lot of calories for your dollar. We go down the list, whole milk, less calories per dollar, bagels, less calories per dollar. And, and then we can look at uh, uh, plant-based proteins that have a lot of calories per dollar, such as penno beans, okay, and lentils. And then we have eggs, 802 calories per dollar. And then we get down here into the meats. And these are the cheapest meats you can basically get in a calories per dollar phase. And I didn't put steaks or anything else up there because they're extremely high, but 72% lean, 27% uh, fat ground beef, that's only 439 calories per dollar and a, a decent amount of protein. But when compared to these others, um, it's a lot more expensive. So if they are gonna buy meats, if they are gonna buy animal-based proteins, it's gonna come from probably the cheapest source, which is gonna be fatty ground beef, breakfast sausages, eggs, uh, poultry, pork, these other kind of things. So. That may be a lot of uh, what folks are seeing and what they're expecting going forward, okay? So kind of on my final slide, I wanna talk just a bit about recovery. Uh, there's been some projections out there from um, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley projecting a you know, 30 to 40% contraction in quarter number two, uh, a, sm a smaller contraction in quarter number one because it was just the final two weeks of the, of the quarter that really hit hard. And by definition, two quarters of negative growth is defined as a recession. Now that can be any amount of negative growth, 0.1% all the way up to 50% for, for two, quarter, two quarters. But the projections for the second quarter are not pretty. They're more looking like a 
25, 35% contraction in the second quarter. And, and that starts to lean more towards a depression than a recession, a, a drop that large. It takes a lot of growth to come out of that. So essentially the four different recovery methods and the fourth one I kind of put together myself, we've got some who are talking about the rapid recovery. Okay, so we get through the second quarter of, of, of large contraction. And then in the third and fourth quarters, we, the, the economy booms. This assumes that a lot of the businesses that are in trouble right now and needing loans and infusions of cash uh, remain in operation. Most people get their, the vast majority of people get their jobs back and away we go. And by you know January 1, 2021, we're back to where we were. Okay, so the second um, scenario that some have talked about is basically a second spike. We get the, and, and again, you know, in a lot of these situations, just like with a hurricane, everybody's a meteorologist. Well, during a pandemic, everybody's a virologist or, or a epidemiologist or something. I, I admit that I am not. So I'm just taking my cues from the experts in that field. But see this growth pattern? Okay, we come out of it. Then we have a drop. We have this fall spike in uh, uh, in infection rates and so forth. Maybe we don't have lockdowns, but people get scared. Spending habits again uh, do not increase like they would have. And so we have a double dip. Okay, so we, re we recede again. And then finally we come out of it maybe, maybe next year sometime. And the one that mo a lot of folks are afraid of is number three, that's my, the slow recovery. Okay, so we dropped fairly rapidly and we don't have this big spike. It's just this long, perhaps multi-year uh, growth path the people who lost their jobs, the businesses that went out of business, uh, they don't come back. A lot of them don't come back. Not the original business. For instance, if you got a viable restaurant on the street corner that was making money, maybe that business, that particular owner doesn't come back. But in a year from now, it's under new management. Somebody buys it. It, it becomes viable again. But again, that takes months, maybe years to, to eventually occur. I tend to be of the mind that number four is going to be the most likely path forward, assuming we don't have a double dip. If we can get things under control, if we don't have this massive double dip in the fall, we have this, re this big contraction that happens, okay, the last two quarters. We get a quick increase, okay, with the business that remained viable that we're able to stick it out through this, through this pandemic. Yeah, but then not all of them come back, okay? A lot of them struggle and, and just basically call it quits. And so we have this longer term, slower growth path to get back to where we were. So we have this pretty quick increase and then things tend to taper off and it takes us several quarters, maybe years to get back to the size of GDP, the size of uh, the economy that we had in the past as some businesses are lost. M many of them are retained, but most businesses, uh, a lot of businesses are wind up lost and we have uh, some intermediate and longer term unemployment that stays somewhat sticky for a while. But uh, again, a lot of it's going to depend on um, exactly what happens with the virus and the pandemic and how long states are in shutdown. A lot of them are being extended. Uh, we're making guesses on the economy and we're doing the best we can on that. But a lot of it depends on the health crisis going on. And that, that is not something that, that, that we're all experts in. So we're all kind of watching that going forward. But this is right now the situation and some of the scenarios that we see uh, moving into the future. And with that, I believe I'll be turning it over to Ron Haugen. Okay, good afternoon. Getting, getting my mic set right here. Um, my first slide uh, shows the, uh, talking about the CARES Act. Um, we probably have all known about this in the, in the media, the $1,200 uh, per person, 24, uh, 2400 per, per couple, 500 per child, um, uh, phasing out after 75,000. Uh, last time, Brian talked about the unemployment benefits, an extra 600 a week, and then states adjust that based on their, their state unemployment rules. Um, student loans, I wanted to, to touch on, there's a waiver of two months of payments that you don't have to pay, and then it extends the, the first repayment to September 30th. Now, all, this, all these things are fluid. Trying to dig this stuff out of, out of that, that $2.2 trillion package is tough, and, and, uh, and that's the way it stands at this point. Um, there was a, a rule change on retirement accounts that uh, 
of that that you are uh, the with the normal 10% penalty for early withdrawal can was waived and they are allowing you to withdraw up to $100,000 for a corona virus related requirement i don't know maybe maybe a lot of people don't have much left in their retirement after account after the stock market crash but uh, those are those are something those are some things that were in the in the uh, in the act my next slide i'm going to talk about um, small business loans and this is a big deal um, still just kind of digging into the information to, 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 to get it out to you, just to make you aware of it, and there'll be more details coming down the pike. Um, it is retroactive for expenses from February 15th through June 30th, and you can get a small business loan uh, for the maximum of the lesser, uh, the maximum loan you can get is the lesser of 2.5 times the average monthly payroll costs, or $10 million. Okay, and the government will guarantee these, they're called 7A loans to 100% through the end of the year. Now you can use this loan to pay payroll, healthcare benefits, mortgage, interest, rent, utility, and interest on other debts, even if you took on those obligations before February 15th. I don't know what happened to my slide there. There we go. Um, the terms of the loans are 10 year maximum and the maximum interest rate at 4%. Uh, it waives the, the borrower, borrower and lender fees and the banks will get reimbursement for that. Now all this information is going out to the banks and, and, it, and it'll be administered not through the SBA but through banks. There is 349 billion appropriated. I'm not sure how long that will last. But normally now, agriculture farmers uh, do not qualify for SBA loans, but it's nothing really in the act that says they don't. So we're waiting for guidance on that if farmers qualify for them or not. Now, my next slide is, is important because it talks about the forgiveness of the small business loans. Now, banks are, should be getting this information this week and you need, the banks need to be on the SBA list I guess there's a list of banks that handle SBA loans. And for businesses that want one of these loans, they need to go to a bank that is, that's on the list. And typically they probably go to their normal lender, or if not, find a lender that is. Um, and what happens is you're eligible for forgiveness eight weeks for up to, eight, you can be forgiven eight, for an eight week period after the loan origi origination. And there's also some stipulations, of course, you need to act in good faith. Well, I'm assuming you, you do that for any loan you get. Um, you do not uh, require any collateral. Uh, and forgiveness will be prorated based on the percentage of employees reduced compared to last year. So what it is, it's trying to help you keep your employees employed. So if you've laid off people and you don't have as many employees as you did a year ago, your forgiveness will not be 100%, it, it will be prorated. But if you hire some of those people back, if you get this loan, hire, rehire some of those people, by June 30th, you will not be penalized for that. Of course, you have to have the, all the payroll document, documentation to do this, and the banks, they do have 60 days to act on this. And that's what I know about the, the, the small business loans at this point, and hopefully we'll get more information in the future. The last thing I was gonna talk about was some income tax changes that they threw into the, into the package. We probably all heard that the, the tax day is changed to July 15th from April 15th. They did put a charitable contribution deduction of $300, of what they call above the line. You don't need to itemize to take that. And they, did, they did also change the net operating loss carry back rules. And I think this is important because more than likely some of these businesses, if they survive without going bankrupt, um, will have a net operating loss. And back when the tax cut bill was passed two, two years ago, uh, um, they changed the carry back rules that businesses could not carry back a loss, they could only carry it forward. Only farmers could carry it back two years. They changed it now so that all businesses can carry back five years. So if a business did generate a net operating loss, that they are allowed to carry it back 
and maybe they can get a refund of some taxes paid. So that would probably hopefully help their cash flow. There was some limitations on carry on carry backs. Uh, you could, uh, I know for farmers, they could only carry back 80% of the loss, but they removed those limitations completely for 2020. Uh, for large, uh, large firms, there was a limit on interest deductibility. They raised that from 30 to 50%. Now, there's also a defer, deferral of, of payroll de de uh, tax deposits, and, and that included, includes your FC tax. Now, we're still waiting for more information on that. Well, I don't know if it's, if it's just the employee match or if, the, if it's the employer part, but there is definitely a deferral. And it's actually deferred until 2021 or even 2022, the way it looks. But we're waiting for more information on this as well. But just to make you aware of that, that these are some things that we're, we're that are in the in the package, to, uh, and we wanted to make you aware of that, and we'll let you know as soon as we know things. So next, I guess Tim is up. Oh, Frayne, I guess. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Frayne Olson. I'm a crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, coming from you, coming live um, from the spare bedroom at my house. Uh, so I'm, we're all trying to make the best out of uh, some very unusual conditions and situations here. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, prospective plantings report and some of the implications that might have as we move forward into the into the um, into the next. Uh, cropping year. Uh, up until this point, I know I've been trying to get farmers to be cautious about shifting acres. Um, given this report, we're seeing some minor adjustments in the marketplace. I guess I'd like to talk about that. So if you look at the table in the top row, um, that was the average trade estimate, the pre-report pre um, estimate of the traders before the report came out. So the, the traders in the marketplace were expecting about a 94 million acre uh, corn plantings, about 85 million acres soybeans, and about 45 million acres of, of all wheat. And again, of that, about 12.7 was spring wheat and about um, almost 31 million acres of winter wheat. Um, I also provided kind of the high, high end of the range and the low end of the range from what the private uh, analysts were, were suggesting. The row in red is what the prospective plantings uh, report actually said. Now, before I go any further, I want to make sure everybody understands these are, this is not a USDA forecast. This is actual USDA survey numbers from farmers. So across the entire US survey, um, USDA surveyed 79,983 farmers to try and get these numbers. So they tried to cut, have a, a pretty broad coverage. Um, they, they broke it down to make sure that they have a minimum number of farmers in each state to make sure that each state is represented well also. So again, when we look at about a 97 million acre survey number versus about a 94 million acre uh, pre-trade estimate, um, that was a little bit of a shock to the marketplace. Uh, we, we were not expecting that large an increase in, in potential corn acreage. Um, on the flip side, you know, the average trade goes was about 85 million acres for soybeans. The, the report came out and said about 83 and a half. On the wheat side, when we look at all wheat as well as uh, winter wheat and spring wheat, came out very, very close to what the trade is expecting. So again, when we look at what these numbers mean this year versus what we had last year, on the very bottom of that table, on, on the row um, highlighted in blue, that was the actual planted acreage in 2019. And again, notice on soybeans, we had a pretty significant drop in soybean plantings last year just because of the wet conditions and all the prevent plant that went on. So if we look at last year as kind of a reference point saying about 90 million acres was, was what we planted for all corn last year and a forecast this year of 97 million, that's again a pretty substantial increase. Um, I, I did also put on the very bottom, kind of highlighted in green, what we did in 2018. And the reason I did that was primarily for soybeans. Again, the 2019 number for soybeans was a little bit skewed just because we did have such a wet spring and, and the, the large percent per event planting numbers. So again, we're looking at, a, at, a, at a, a shift into corn and out of soybeans. Now on the next slide, I looked at the information for just North Dakota. And again, in North Dakota, there were uh, 3,177 farmers that were surveyed in North Dakota to come up with these, these averages. 
Um, on the far right hand column is the prospective planning's numbers for 2020. So that was the survey results we got out on Tuesday. Um, I also included what happened in 2018 as well as 2019 for reference. I've highlighted the three kind of the three major crops, the three big crops we have in the state. Um, corn uh, at the forecast right now, the expectation is that we'll have 3.2 million acres planted corn versus 3.5 from last year. For spring wheat, uh, 6.1 million acres this year versus 6.7 million acres last year. And then the soybean, which to me was kind of a surprising number, an increase to 6.6 .6 million acres or basically a rebound from 5.6 million acres last year. Now I've had several interviews, uh, several people ask and call or email asking, well, what happens if, you know, what, what might have caused this? And I think this is a combination of two things. Number one, kind of the price relationships we saw in the markets as farmers are putting their budgets together and trying to decide what to do. The price rel relative prices we saw for these crops um, when the surveys were taken and as farmers were putting their budgets together, but also kind of the expectation for a, a, a kind of a struggle this spring, depending upon how the spring plays out, uh, the potential for some prevent plant acres, um, the fact that we have some unharvested corn that still remains in the field and the concerns about getting that harvested in time to be able to come back and actually replant the next year's crop. So I, I do think that some of these numbers do reflect all of that information. Um, and again, as we move forward, as we get more information about what spring planting and, and spring planting progress might be, as well as now we've seen a slight shift in the relative prices for crops, uh, we might see some minor adjustments, not only nationally, but also here in North Dakota. The next slide is, um, includes some of the, the, what I call small market crops. Some of these crops that are not quite as large in, in, in acreage, but, also, but are also very important from the economic standpoint within the state. Um, I did highlight dryable beans because I've been getting a lot of questions about dryable beans and potential increase in acreage. Uh, based on the survey, it looks like about 650,000 acres versus 615,000 acres last year. Again, when we look at relative prices, the pinnel bean, navy bean, and black bean prices are pretty, pretty strong compared to some of the other things we're seeing in the marketplace right now. Um, and again, coming back to some of Brian's uh, comments earlier that as people change their consuming habits, their buying habits, they're, they're, they're eating more meals in home rather than eating them in a restaurant. Um, they're changing their, their, at least temporarily changing their, their habits. This is having an impact on short term on both the dryable bean as well as we're starting to see a little bit of an uptick now in the lentil market as well. Um, this increase in dryable beans I do think will be limited uh, mainly because of seed availability. On the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit nationally about what is the market signaling to us. And again, um, people have talked about this corn soybean ratio or the relationship between corn prices and soybean prices. Uh, so what I have listed here is the November uh, 2020 soybean contract out of the futures market in Chicago. I have the December corn contract and that's on the top. So on the right hand side, the black line is the futures market for soybeans. The blue line is the futures market for corn going back into June of last year. And then on the bottom, I have a line where we're looking at that soybean corn ratio. So you take the soybean price divided by the corn price. And, and I have th I've drawn in three different lines there. The blue line is a 2.5. Uh, below that is a red line at 2.4 and above that is a uh, red line at 2.6. So these are kind of the standard numbers that we use in the marketplace to try and say, well, is there is the market trying to provide an incentive for corn or incentive for beans or are we relatively neutral? So 2.5, that ratio of 2.5, again, soybean divided by corn, is considered to be neutral. When, when you look at the crop budgets and relative profitability, that seems to be kind of a neutral balance. By the time we get down to a ratio of 2.4 or less, provides a very strong incentive to start planting more corn. In fact, in fact the budgets for corn on corn in the, in, in the primary growing regions actually work better than soybeans. If you increase to or change that ratio to uh, something closer to 2.6 or even above a 2.6, very strong incentive to try and increase soybean plantings relative to corn. So if you look at the time period and when this survey was taken in the middle, beginning to middle of March, 
uh, that ratio, that corn soybean ratio was about a 2.35, almost down to a 2.3 at times. So when the survey was taken, the market was signaling, we want more corn, we don't, we need to back off the soybean acreage. Well, notice now what's happened in the last few days, that ratio has come back to more of a neutral position. So the marketplace may have over signaled a little bit on, on the side of corn and planting some more additional corn. And I think they're rebalancing now saying, no, we don't need quite that many corn acres. In particular, I think because of concerns about the um, ethanol demand, which I know Dave Ripplinger will talk about in a minute. If you go to the next slide, um, this, I, I do something similar with the relationship between spring wheat and corn. Um, this, is not, this is something that I have developed and been watching over the last several years. Um, what I found is that a, a, a ratio of about a 1.5 is kind of a neutral. If you do the budgeting and you look at relative profitability, a price ratio between spring wheat and corn of about 1.5 is kind of neutral. If it gets above that, there's an incentive to plant some more spring wheat. If it's below that, there's more of an incentive to plant corn and corn acres. And again, when we go back and look historically, or look back at when the surveys were taken for farmers, and we look at that time period early to mid-March, the ratio was down at about a 1.4, which again provides a pretty strong economic incentive to plant corn and back off the spring wheat. Now, since then, and we had these big corn numbers come in nationally, I think there's some additional concern that they may have, the, the market may have overestimated or over-signaled um, the corn acreage. We're now getting back into something that's a bit more neutral, a 1.54. I would consider kind of a neutral to a slight incentive to, to, to um, plant spring wheat. So as we move forward, I guess my, the bottom line, what I'm trying to explain to everybody is that we do need to watch what's going on. I think there'll be some flexibility that farmers will have as we move into spring's work. Uh, but again, my recommendation was not to use uh, the coronavirus and all the concerns about what was happening as, an, as a reason for trying to dr make any dramatic changes or shifts in your cropping pattern. So um, watch what's going on in the marketplace. It's trying to send you a signal, pay attention to relative prices, kind of those price relationships, as well as what the absolute prices are. So again, to make some adjustments in your planting intentions, I, I think is reasonable, but I wouldn't try and chase the market based on what's going on with the coronavirus right now. So with that, I'll hand things over to Dave, or to Tim, excuse me. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, one of you hosts have to start my video, it says, because you uh, stopped it. So I'll get going here while you start my picture. I really don't need it. Uh, everybody is asking, well, Ron talked to you about the CARES Act, but he didn't mention the egg part of the CARES Act. And uh, so, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the all the livestock producers are asking me uh, how much am I going to get from that 9.5 billion dollars? And the short answer to that is that no one knows. USDA has a monumental task ahead of them to try to distribute it, but I'll just tell you a little bit about what I do know. Uh, it does cover all livestock, so that includes all the livestock groups. You know, I'm not going to, I can't go through them all, but it's cattle, sheep, hogs, dairy. You've seen the pictures on the media about milk being dipped and or dumped and so on, and, and poultry plus fruit and vegetable producers and all direct markets and so on. So there are um, many, many, many produce, producer groups that are needing money and uh, 9.5 billion may sound like a lot, but uh, when you look at all those different groups, uh, it, it isn't. And so uh, USDA, like I said, has a monumental task. They are asking for help from uh, producer groups and they're gonna have to do a rulemaking process. And I assume then they will take recommendations at that time. And so now all of the state and national livestock and produce commodity groups are working very diligently uh, to send recommendations to USDA so they can decide what to do in the rulemaking process. And obviously, 
Uh, everybody wants a big slice of the 9.5 million, which is kind of a small pie. So uh, uh, here in North Dakota, Senator Hovind today had a meeting with the commodity groups in Bismarck, and that includes the other, the, the crop groups as well, that their money will come out of a different pot out of the CCC. And so he's getting, trying to get an idea to uh, forward that on to USDA as well. So anyway, my recommendation to use you, if, if you have uh, comments or ideas or recommendations, check with your appropriate commodity group and let them know and work with them and we will keep you informed. Uh, my first slide here uh, to go into some of the content, uh, you know, uh, Brian talked to you about the economy and how it's tubed and Ron mentioned the crashing stock market. And so I just have the June live cattle futures market here, which is in the black, the high low and closes there. And then the solid green line is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is a proxy for the stock market. And so I, uh, if you go back to February 12th, the stock market was record high at 29,551. And it had been going up and up and up for several years and the economy was booming. and uh, and you know unemployment was going down and everything was was just rosy all-time record high on the stock market there on february 12th and since that time you see it absolutely crashed down to the 1900s and it has came back i don't know when i looked earlier today it was at about 21,000. but anyway you see there's a 95 percent correlation there since february 12th of the june live cattle and the Dow Jones Industrial Average just showing you how important the economy is to the livestock market and particularly the cattle market. And, um, and uh, you know, we just had all this extreme volatility. Today alone, you know, in, in June live cattle, we have a $4.50 limit can go up or down over the previous day's close. And the last time I looked, it was nearing that about $8 range in prices today. It was at the beginning of the day, it was up almost the limit four dollars so i thought maybe you know the little good news there and then it crashed so just a lot of volatility there so moving into my next slide and uh what people are wondering is how bad is it and so here is a, just a 20-year chart of feeder cattle futures the nearby feeder cattle futures and so um you know you can see on that chart that we are at for sure yearly contract lows. And again, it's the same thing we've had. Uh, the limit on the feeder cattle futures is an expanded limit today because it was a uh, limit down yesterday. And so the expanded limit is 6.35. And so again, we've had a $10 more range the last I looked on the feeder cattle futures, that's just today. But more importantly here, I'm just you know showing you where we were at, where we're at. And so uh, there, uh, uh, you know, where we're trading today, we need to go back to 2011 levels. And so, you know, to find any support there. And so, yeah, we've really, really declined and uh, really, really a tough market that I've been talking about. The other people kind of mentioned, but if this is your first time on here, uh, I, you know, Oh, this is the third time and let's go to the next slide then uh, here and uh, you know last two weeks and then today the I've been showing you this chart the chart on the left then was last week and so I just brought the new chart to the right just to show you kind of the dramatic impact that we've had these are 750 to 800 pound feeder cattle in North Dakota, which is probably the most we have right now for a market class left to sell. I know a lot of background of cattle have been sell, sold, but uh, talked to the livestock producer group last night and we still have some to sell. And so the red line on the solid line on both charts is just the cash market. And uh, so comparing the two charts, you see last week, the market had responded a little bit to the Dow going up and to all the meat going off the shelves and the bare shelves and so on. So there was a response there. And then the red squares are the futures market. So you see the futures market last week compared to how, you know, it's went down. And the, the dark red line on the right hand side chart is 
is our current chart. And the cash market fell about $15 this week for 750 to eight weight steers. And I'll show you the market report in a minute. And then futures also about $15 down. So absolutely a disastrous week. And for those of you that still have background of cattle left to sell, again, it's at a, just at a disastrous level. But it's, you know, the way Brian talks with that macro and, and uh, all those issues, it probably even go lower next week. So if you're holding out for, you know, hoping for some improvement in probably in the next month or more, more what Brian talked about a long time, it just is not going to be there. So just got a disastrous situation. There are no good marketing strategies to use. And your really only strategy is a financial one, talking to your banker and uh, seeing what you can do there. So moving to the next slide is just kind of the same thing here. This is the market report for North Dakota markets and only two um, market reports available this week from uh, Kists and, and Mandan and and from Napoleon were the only two reported because of a volume basis. But there you see, uh, I won't go through all these and, and you can look at this, this is being recorded, so if you want to, and these, by the way, are on my website that you have earlier if you want to look at the market reports for individual markets or whatever. But you see last week highlighted there, 750 to eight weight steers last week averaged one, a little over 138 and I don't know. 122, uh, 78 this week. And so, uh, uh, you know, a decline there, like I said before, of $15. And so that's very significant, about 120 bucks a head down in one week. And, you know, again, just an absolutely disastrous situation. And um, the lightweight calves too went down, not as much, the 550s uh, went down about, I guess, around $13, but still just uh, just a terrible decline in the market. And, you know, it goes back, back to all those things that Brian talked about. So uh, move on. Uh, one of the problems we have too is we've got record meat production. We've got record beef production, as you can see on the left, record pork production. I don't have the chicken slide on here, but we've got record chicken production. So we've got record production. And going into the year, you know, back, you know, prior to the, the February 12th, all the fundamentals looked so good. I, you know, this was a headwind with all this meat production, but it didn't look like it was a problem because again, a record high stock market, the economy was moving, or just booming. And we had settled all the trade agreements with our major trading partners for all the meat and with the African swine fever and the deficit of meat, particularly over in Southeast Asia and so on. It looked like we would have record exports of beef and pork and so on. And so we would be able to get through this production with no problem. And of course that all went south on us February 12th too with the coronavirus and it's hitting the world too. So that's gonna affect exports and then our domestic economy just absolutely in the tubes is gonna affect demand there. So we've got a lot, a lot of meat to sell in a, in a much more limited market. So that's one of the things that's causing the terrible prices and also the volatility because trying to, you know, guess ahead of what's going to happen. So move along to the next slide. Just kind of to show you some of the things that Brian talked about, but bring it back to beef, for instance, on the left-hand side is wholesale boneless. This is 90% of lean uh, cow beef. And, uh, you know, there's a, a big demand for hamburger. I think last week they said the amount of hamburger, or at least in the last two weeks, that moved through retail stores was double what it was last year. And so you see on the home of sale bonus, prices are up, um, you know, kind of back to average. They were depressed a little bit last year because we had a huge uh, slaughter of, of cows, both dairy cows and beef cows. and and so on. But, you know, that market, you just looking at the last couple of weeks, has bounced back up because of the big demand for hamburger. But go to the right-hand chart. These are tenderloins. And usually, there's a steady market throughout the year. You can see the dotted line was last year, and the red line, the longer term, five-year, 2014 to 18 average. But, you know, it, they're, they're just right at 
$10 there until the end of the year comes, and then we have the big holiday demand for tenderloins from Thanksgiving through Christmas, and then they come down. But you see the big decline in tenderloins since the coronavirus simply because they go through the food service, the restaurant sector is where they're all sold, and very difficult to sell them at the retail level. So, you know, tenderloins are going down and hamburger going up. So move, go to the last slide here, I think that I'm gonna talk about. I haven't talked about the other commodities much, and they're, you know, being affected as well. And probably every week I might bring in a different one, but this, you can see on slaughter lamb prices, how they tube there. And, you know, this maybe isn't all due to the coronavirus because there's some seasonality here, the peak demand for lamb is right before Easter and Easter's kind of early this year and the buying for it to get it into both retail stores and the lamb market is even more dependent on the white tablecloth restaurant business than even the beef industry is and it's the east coast and west coast on top of where all the problems are and so that entered in too but uh, everything all those factors going together along with some a few packing fat problems and see that the slaughter lamb prices have declined as, as well as the other commodities. So um, next we're going to get into another very volatile market on the energy side and, and, uh, and talk. David Ripplinger is going to visit. Uh, great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts, Bioenergy Economic Specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, probably the best analogy for what's going on in the energy market, including ethanol, is we have a number of parties who are uh, getting signals to slow down and they're not. Uh, because of the COVID-19 COVID situation, uh, we've seen a dramatic decline in gasoline and ethanol use uh, at the retail level you know, for consumers. Uh, and that's uh, led to, uh, and with the expectations, you know, lower prices. Uh, unfortunately, what hasn't happened is we haven't seen uh, an adequate decline in gas or ethanol production, uh, re refining, uh, and going back even further, uh, you know, going further upstream, we see that there really, there has been no change in U.S. oil production. And, and simply what's going to happen is because we're not uh, making these changes fast enough that there's uh, going to be pretty tough times ahead in the upcoming weeks uh, with the expectation that we'll likely or possibly run out of storage for, for fuel uh, and for oil, which will lead to uh, a significant disruption uh, in the marketplace uh, a, 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 across uh, all of these products. Um, <clears throat> because we haven't seen a slowdown in uh, oil production, gasoline and ethanol refining, we've seen a dramatic increase in stocks. Uh, and for the next few slides, I'll, I'll kind of look at some of these uh, ind individual markets more at hand. Uh, this slide shows uh, oil production and use. Uh, on the oil side, we call it crude oil input. It's input into a refinery. Uh, and if we look at the, that green line, which is that crude oil input, you can see that in the last week uh, that we've seen a dramatic decline in the input that's going into the refinery, but not, uh, not, a, not enough, essentially. Um, we, we had uh, the same production last week as we've had the last few weeks at 13 million barrels of oil per day, uh, which is, uh, you know, near record. Uh, and that isn't show signs of slowing down, although with, with low oil prices, uh, Bach and WTI across the board, uh, we still haven't seen a slowdown in production. And we're seeing a number of rigs starting to come offline, and there's discussion of, of shutting in some wells, but that's staying relatively flat. And so you, you see that decline in the blue line. And so that's gonna obviously translate in, in to a slight decrease in diesel and gasoline production. So on the next slide, on the next slide, we'll just be talking a little bit about stocks. Um, and so clearly we see this, this buildup, the blue line is, is crude oil stocks. We saw a, a buildup of, of uh, it was also happened to be uh, 13 million barrels for the week, uh, which, is, which is a substantial amount. If you look at that, that orange line in the last few years, we've only had a few other weeks where we've had that much of a buildup. Uh, but again, it's, it, it, it's not necessarily uh, not enough and it's gonna continue to in, increase, especially in the near term. Um, 
and on my, my next slide, uh, finally moving on to the ethanol point of view, we'll talk about input again. This is essentially uh, ethanol moving from that refine, that, that corn ethanol refinery uh, to a blender, to a rack, uh, to, to be put in the supply chain. You can see that dramatic decline in input, so in essentially use. Uh, you look at production above it, it's still substantially higher. And so we're not seeing that cut in production uh, commensurate with what's, what's, what's being pushed uh, down the supply chain, that's a problem. Uh, the result is, uh, you look at the purple line, is we have an increase in stocks. And right now we have record stocks of ethanol uh, at a time where we're having a, a dramatic decrease in use. And again, it's the analogy essentially is you have this freight train that needs to slow down. It's, it's getting the red signals, uh, telling it that, that, that it needs to, to stop and, and across the board, certainly not just ethanol, but gasoline is, and oil as well. Uh, we're just not slowing down quick enough and that's just gonna cause more harm. Using, you know, looking specifically at ethanol, we'll continue to see these stocks build. I, you know, I, I, I fully expect that the ethanol use will continue to decline for the month of April. Uh, production will decline, but not fast enough and those stocks will dramatically build. You know, right now we, we have, uh, you know, not only a record amount of stocks, but you commensurate with that an extremely large amount of, of days of ethanol in storage, uh, which, is, which is not good. And, and eventually for these, these markets to reach any sort of equilibrium, we've got we've to deal with those issues. And, and it doesn't seem like we're going to be getting there anytime soon. Uh, and then my last slide is just to, to look a little bit about uh, things that Frank talked about with, with pers perspective plannings and the, the, the large amount of corn that's not going to be used for ethanol this next year. So just looking at 2019, the, the bold numbers are uh, bushels used uh, either for ethanol or for other uses. So last year, this marketing year, you know, we're, we're looking at about uh, uh, 5.4 billion bushels of corn, about a third of the crop being used for uh, ethanol and the remainder for, for other uses, including storage for the next year. Moving to 2020, if we actually realize this nine point, uh, excuse me, 97 million acres of corn production and had a yield, uh, average national yield of 180 uh, bushels per acre, you know, we would see this huge increase in production. Uh, and now if we think about we're going to have a 25% reduction in ethanol use, uh, we, we see this, this, this gap increase tremendously. So if we see a 25% reduction in corn ethanol production and corn use, you know, we'll be down to about 4 billion gallons of, of corn for ethanol. Uh, and if we see that, that increase as which came from perspective plannings and close to trend line yield, we'll have 13 and a half billion bushels of corn that need to find a different home. Uh, which is far above what we've we've ever seen, uh, and again, a, 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 about a fifty percent increase over what we had for this marketing year. Uh, so, just just again, kind of revisiting some things where we're talking about uh, this pushing and, and affecting other markets. This 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 corn ethanol issue uh, is is really significant, not just for 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 corn, but for all of agriculture here in the United States. Thank you very much, guys. Um, we're to the point now where we can go with a little Q&A. And that would be uh, just using the chat feature, please. And uh, we have one question already. Uh, just as a reminder, too, that we have um, some feedback we're looking for. It's got three quick questions. And there's also more recording information if you, on the screen. <clears throat> one of the questions was, uh, some businesses are reducing employees' salaries by 20%. Why 20% and not 10, 25, or 30%? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, 10% a lot of times has to do with sometimes uh, restructures or businesses that are going through maybe a tough stretch. I, I've seen 10% um, reductions in general contractors, like right after the 2008, 2009 financial crisis as they attempt to save some money, especially if they're a labor intensive industry where a 10% cut 
uh, makes a huge difference to the bottom line. I think right now with the uncertainty that's uh, surrounding things, they're looking at more like a 20% cut um, to conserve money. And when you start talking about a 30% cut, something above that, and first of all, people like round numbers. They don't, they're not going to do a 9% or an 18 or a 22. Uh, they're going to pick a nice round number likely divisible by 10. But when you start getting into 30%, well, now you're talking more about a furlough or something to that nature because cutting, cutting wages by 30%, the psychological impact of things like that, it, it probably prevents that. So once you start getting to cutting wages that much, you're probably entering into furloughs and layoffs rather than pay cuts. So I think 20% being obviously well above 10 has to do with the uncertainty that's going on, the financial strain that they're facing. And if we find businesses thinking that they need to cut it by 30 or percent or even more, it's probably more likely they're gonna go to a furlough or a layoff program than actually cutting wages by that much. House price response to economic decline. House price response, okay. So going into this before the pandemic actually happened, uh, the home prices and uh, uh, new construction was actually looking really strong. Uh, and and home, new home starts, uh, new housing starts and uh, uh, new mortgage applications and stuff. It's kind of has a lag, a pretty, you know, a deep lag to it, kind of like the monthly unemployment numbers. Now we have seen some, a huge uptick in new mortgage applications, but the vast majority of them, well over 80%, um, as from what I've seen, are in uh, refinances rather than new purchases. And in the last few weeks, the application rate for new purchases has declined um, pretty dramatically, as you would expect during periods of great uncertainty. A lot of folks aren't willing to, aren't in a position to take on a new mortgage um, or upgrade or anything like that. So they kind of wind up in a wait and see. I think that this is probably going to have at least a hold even or probably a depressing value on home values this year uh, as people have a hard time possibly getting it sold. Not saying that you won't be able to sell your house. I don't think the market's going to be extremely hot right now because folks aren't willing to take on uh, new debt. Now, there is a price range that homes typically sell pretty easily, and that's that $150,000 to $250,000 range. And there's a simple reason for that, and that is the fact that uh, that's what uh, most, most people can afford. A lot of people fall into that. I can afford $150,000 to $200,000 home but you start getting into these 300, 350 and 400,000, especially in areas like North Dakota and uh, maybe Minnesota and Nebraska where I'm from. Uh, I, don't, I don't think those are gonna move very well. The, the 150, the 250s maybe, but then again, you have the problem with uh, people being laid off and let go who fall into that 150 to $250,000 afford, affordability range. So yes, I, th I think this is gonna have a, a pretty strong negative impact on home values and uh, new mortgage applications into the spring. Brian, this is directed to you. How are grain exports to China, Southeast Asia going? Is international trade and commodities slowing because countries are shutting down due to COVID? Um, okay, so we did get a uh, weekly, on a weekly basis, we get export sales reports from USDA. We got one last week. Um, and again, there's always kind of a weak lag. Um, so, you know, as of a week and a half ago, um, exports had slowed down. Although this morning there was an announcement that China came in and bought 150,000 tons of U.S. corn. That's uh, nine cargoes, nine vessels worth of corn. So I do think the Chinese government, um, in particular the state-owned uh, buying agencies, are looking at um, at these price levels and thinking, you know, this is a pretty good opportunity to come in and buy some U.S. commodities now that we've had this retracement. So we're not seeing a, a real strong demand base. I think there's a lot of the international buyers are caught, just like many of the domestic buyers right now, a bit concerned about what the future would look like. Um, what kind of, of, of inventories do we want to carry going into these, these kinds of economic times? Now, there were a couple also reports that came out. India, I guess, and this is something I'm watching fairly closely for the pulse market. 
um, the Indian government came out and said that they were going to start increasing their uh, state-owned reserves to try and build an additional buffer just in case that there was some kind of supply disruptions, that there was some, um, you know, some shipping problems for their imports. Um, so they are looking at trying to build some inventories. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about the port disruptions or potential for port disruptions down in South America. Um, and, and again, there's always kind of a little bit of a battle going on between the labor and, and the port facilities on making sure those vessels get loaded in time. Um, so it's been very sporadic. It's been kind of hit and miss. Um, it, it, there are some, some folks who are looking opportunistically to try and buy, buy inventories if they're in a position where they feel like they can do that. Uh, but it's, this is going to be a, a very unsettled time. I think it's going to be very, very difficult to try and forecast, um, you know, exports at this level, at these levels. Uh, you know, there are some buying going on, but it's, it's not as, as fluid. It's not as, as structured as we'd like it. Again, the buying that I've seen so far is really trying to, to build inventories in case there's a problem. So um, demand base is coming out of this, um, you know, COVID-19 pandemic globally is going to be a real challenge for some countries because they're really, really taking a hit in some parts of the world. And there's another question. Um, how much can markets recover by harvest if the pandemic subsides mid-May, mid-June? Any news on MFP 3.0 due to COVID-19? Okay, let me start with the second one first, and then I'll, I'll back into the, the, the price recovery. Um, so there is some money, and, and I think Ron hinted at it a little bit, there is some additional money in this last stimulus package for, um, uh, for supplemental payments to farmers. And I know Tim talked about it a little bit on the livestock side. We don't know a lot of the details of that. One of the things we do know is that will not be an MFP payment because MFP um, was, was really defined and identified as something for um, a, a compensation for the trade disruptions. And if everybody remembers back, the, the, the balance of products, kind of the, um, the payments that were made by commodity were very heavily weighted towards soybeans. Corn got very, very small payments, and, and I know that caused some, the corn, corn council and corn growers some, some heartburn. Um, in this case, because this is more about the virus, this is more about the general economic downturn, uh, the indication I'm getting, at least informally right now, is that it will not be a formal MFP payment like they had been structured before. Um, so it, we're, we're looking at a slightly different program. We obviously don't know the details. Um, and again, as, as uh, I think it was Tim was saying, Senator Hovman is having some meetings with commodity organizations to talk about ways that we might be able to come up with an, an equitable way of trying to distribute this across commodities. Um, when it comes back to, you know, how much can we recover by harvest, I want to point back to some of the things that Brian pointed out on the, on the recovery, the economic recovery. Um, I think we can get a little bit of a rebound this summer, especially as we get into the summer months. I'm not going to be overly optimistic uh, on what those price levels might be. I am a bit concerned about a, a second bounce if, of, um, as we get into the fall, where, where this, this uh, COVID-19, the cases it starts to rebound a little bit. I, in my view, I think more of a W type of recovery is possible. And again, the commodity markets will follow something similar to that. Um, I know in one of my previous discussions, I talked a little bit about kind of those upper price bounds. Um, one of the, I can't, in my mind, one of the top end targets for uh, um, new crop soybeans is about nine bucks on the futures, nine dollars on the futures. Um, it, it's going to be very difficult for the soybean market to rebound and push through those levels, given what we know right now. And I guess I'm looking at something like a 390 on the December um, corn futures is one of those targets uh, that's going to be very difficult. We might be get close to that, but it's going to be difficult to push through that level. Uh, let me just pull up really quick the September, the September wheat. I, I guess I'm looking at probably a 560 or a 565 on the September wheat futures as kind of that upper bound that we may have that's going to cause, cause the futures market to, to stall out. So I think we can get some price recovery given a, a, some, hopefully some better economic term, uh, conditions, but I am really concerned right now that we're not going to see a lot of a bounce. 
Tim, a question for you. What's, what are your thoughts on the meat industry? Supply of cattle, hogs, and poultry has got kill capacity maxed out. If plants shut down for one of multiple reasons, what's going to happen to butcher-ready animals? Yeah, absolutely. We're very, very worried about that. And there is going to be disruptions. There already is uh, the cattle plant at Greeley JBS plant. Some employees are refusing to come to work. And we've got uh, a poultry plant just closed down this week in Pennsylvania and, and problems with some other poultry plants, Mississippi, Georgia. The Smithfield hog plant in Sioux City are, is still going, but uh, they've had some uh, there, so very, very much of a concern. You saw my my chart there. We're doing record beef, pork, and poultry production, record numbers of hogs. We're running at full capacity. Our slaughter, our Saturday slaughter kills of cattle and hogs have been up. So it's going to happen, and that's just going to accentuate the problem because we saw last summer with just one beef plant closing down, what that did to the market. So that's just going to be another reason why we are going to be not much hope for any recovery on livestock because as it hits the packing plants and we back up livestock and so on. So absolutely not a good situation. So Tim, any chance the cattle guys could get some of the funds that went to the CCC? Beyond the okay, and that's another good question that I can't answer. The livestock groups did not participate in MFP, and so they have been lobbying from that 9.5 was set aside for them and the produce people because they didn't get money before. And so I'm not sure there's anything in the CCC that says it couldn't be one of the things that will be discussed in the other thing is if this money doesn't go around, I mean, we're already two trillion and you know, our package and so will there be more coming down the pike and depends on how things get, but you know, there certainly may be uh, go to livestock. The, the uh, MFP that was out before out of CCC did go to hog and dairy producers and so, uh, you know, it may be a possibility, but I am not positive on the answer. Uh, is there an update on WIP plus programs, sign up deadline? Can it be done online with uh, FSA offices closed? I can answer that one. I, I don't believe the FSA offices are closed. Uh, you can do business um, uh, by email and phone. They don't want anybody coming into the offices. The, the WIP Plus program, the sign-up has started, uh, so you can go ahead and get involved in that if you, if you want. Uh, just call them. They'll give you all the instructions on, on how to do it online. Thanks. We're just waiting to see if there's anyone else that has any more questions. And while we're waiting, I just want to remind everyone that we're doing these every week at uh, Friday at 12.30 p.m. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things going on and a lot of updates uh, that, that you know, things are changing by the day, um, let alone the week. So we're trying to keep things current by doing this weekly. And if you have any things that you want covered that we're, we're uh, failing to cover right now, uh, shoot us an email for to whom it may concern, and we'll see if we can get to it. It's a good point, even though it's Good Friday, next Friday, this is still going on. It's an oil question. Are Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, talking, or are they more focused on COVID than oil prices? Uh, no, they are talking. There was a conversation uh, between Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. Uh, and there's a tentative agreement to reduce uh, production uh, because of the the glut of oil in the market, which is one of the primary drivers driving down price. Uh, the, the market responded very positively yesterday and again today. Uh, yesterday it was up about 25%. Uh, it's up another $2 today. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a nice signal. Uh, the challenge is like many of these promises is how do, they, uh, do folks actually follow through? Uh, and 
right now it, for, for April will probably be as much as uh, 25 to 30% long every day on, on oil production, about 30 million barrels a day, uh, which is basically as much oil as the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia produce together. Uh, longer term, you know, we're, and, and even before any of this hit, uh, you know, we knew that there was uh, too much oil in the market. Uh, in a month or so, we'll probably be 13 million barrels a day long. And if you think about that, that would be the three parties reducing production by a third, uh, which is a, still a tremendous amount of oil. Uh, and so, yes, they, they, they are talking. Uh, there's been good news from that. Uh, the administration took a, an active role in, in facilitating those conversations, which really needed to happen. At the same time, uh, we'll see what they do. And even if they were able to, to reduce production dramatically, we still have uh, a lot of issues in terms of, again, that, that, that freight train just going too fast for the time being. Um, but it's, it's a very good question. And we'll, we'll, we'll know a lot more. Again, one of the challenges with the, with the oil markets is, you know, we, we have a leg. And so we don't know, I won't know till next Wednesday, what really happened this week. And, you know, there's, folks are not, not necessarily moving as fast as, as we'd like them to, what the prices are indicating for them to do. And then we also have a leg in data, uh, which makes it tough to, to have a, a firm control of what's going on, which is difficult in a time like this, where there's already a lot of uncertainty. Is, is the U.S. likely to support to domestic oil companies? There have been a lot of oil layoffs here in Williams and McKenzie counties the past two weeks. Yeah, so that's a great question. I actually had my last bullet point uh, before I took it off and then sent it in was actually, I mean, the, the oil companies, the, the ethanol refineries, all, all businesses are in Washington right now trying to, to figure out a way that they can survive or take advantage of existing uh, support and stimulus or lay the groundwork for future support. We'll see how that takes place. Uh, uh, Whiting Oil, which is one of the larger players here in, in North Dakota, in the Bakken, declared bankruptcy uh, earlier this week. Uh, that, that was not a surprise. They were in, in, in a precarious situation uh, even before COVID-19. Uh, in terms of what, what's going to happen in North Dakota, uh, even regardless of if there is intervention by the federal government to assist the oil industry, uh, there's too much oil, and the folks who are going to give first are is, is uh, U.S. Shale and the Bakken. And so it's, it's really bad news. I, uh, last week, I had uh, Bakken prices. Uh, earlier this week, they were down below $10 for the first first time in, in the, you know, in, in the last 20 years plus, uh, it's now back up to $16, you know, below $10 is you, you'd be shutting in wells at $16. A lot of folks are still gonna, are, are still gonna, are still gonna pump. Um, but the numbers aren't good. Uh, and in terms of new development, the, the, the current price is far below what they need, uh, to continue, uh, developing new wells. That number, uh, which I also had last week. If you want to go back and just check out that part of the, the the webinar, you know their 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 number that they need to profitably put in a new well is fifty dollars, and we're at sixteen. Uh, for them to profitably operate an existing well is about half. That's about twenty eight dollars, and we're at sixteen. And so the 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 outlook for for domestic oil is not good, uh, and for uh, the Bakken for the oil industry in the state, it's it's it, it's very bad. And just to put things in context, that this is what's on the table is substantially worse than what we've seen in the state uh, in the last five years. It'll, it, what we have and what we expect for the next uh, for the next few years is is worse than what we saw 15, 16, 17. David, what could we expect for a low in diesel fuel? Oh, I I I don't know. There's there's an interesting phenomenon that's going on in the in, in the refining business and the fuel business is right now we've seen a dramatic reduction in gasoline use, which is a primarily uh, passenger uh, fuel. Uh, while 
diesel use has been relatively stable again because that we use that for uh, for industry for transportation for freight and so you know there's there's this push with every barrel that goes into the refinery you can only get so much diesel or gasoline out of it the ratios are relatively fixed so for every barrel that comes in they're making something that the the market still wants in diesel and something they really don't want is in gasoline and so it, at the refinery level the price of gasoline is actually negative uh, how is this actually going to play out in the near term in terms of diesel prices specifically i don't know um, but right now there is some demand uh, the other thing we spoke about last week too is the margins that exist uh, in the fuel business. Right now, they're very, very large, uh, and the question is: Is something going to give in order to, to 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 sell more fuel? The truth is, there isn't really a price of gasoline for me where I'm going to go run to the the gas station and fill up uh, because the I, I have nowhere to go. Um, you know, with, with diesel prices. You know, I don't see uh, a significant decline. And right now, again, we're seeing a rebound. I, didn't, I, I was just looking at the gasoline benchmark. It's up substantially over the last two days, like oil is. I, I'm positive that, that diesel's the same. Uh, and so we, might have, we may, may have already hit uh, at least a wholesale low for, for diesel fuel in the United States, um, depending on what might happen if we do hit that, that, that storage ceiling. And in that case, all bets are off. We have more of a comment than a question. It says oil traffic is dropped off um, and pads that were being set up for rig <clears throat> for all rig work has stopped and that the sites are vacant. Happened quickly over the last two weeks here in Dunn. Yeah, and what I'd say too is we've actually seen, uh, if you look at the, the, the official numbers, we're only down a few rigs in the state. Um, and actually we're, we're reducing rigs at a slower rate than, than, than the purbing is down in Texas. But I mean, that's the exact thing we're going to expect. And, you know, right now we're just under 50 rigs, you know, within a few months, it'll be, it, it, it might be a dozen. Yeah. Another comment about uh, fewer trucks on highway two around Williston last few weeks, mm -hmm. still some moving around, but a lot fewer than before. All right, I think uh, we've run out of questions, which is good. Um, nice long one today, people. <laughs> uh, wanna thank you for participating and you can always uh, check the feedback um, link. And we have three questions on there, just would really love to hear from you. Um, next Friday, same time, uh, and we'll be ready.